Day 163 of the war in Gaza, and in the shadow of a potential ground operation in Rafah, airstrikes were carried out over the weekend in the southern Gaza Strip. The war cabinet has now approved the IDF plan for a Rafah incursion, but the timing remains uncertain. Hamas today confirmed to reporters that Marwan Issa, Hamas chief of staff who was targeted in an Israeli airstrike last week, has been killed. According to the report, Razi Abu Tome, commander of a Hamas brigade, was also killed in the strike. Their bodies remain buried in the rubble. Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Gallant have indicated that the Rafah ground operation plans of the IDF have now been approved and could begin at any time. In the meantime, targeted airstrikes have hit Hamas targets in Rafah, softening the expected entry of ground forces once civilians are removed from the areas of conflict. <laughs> ground forces have yet to operate in Rafah, but the Prime Minister now says that plans have been approved. Forces are operating intensively in southern Gaza's Khan Yunus. Fighter jets struck and destroyed a Hamas weapons depot spotted by the 7th Armored Brigade. Also in Khan Yunus, the Givati Brigade directed strikes on Hamas operatives spotted entering and exiting a site used by the terrorists. The Air Force and IDF ground forces killed about 25 terrorists over the weekend in Khan Yunus and Nusirat. The IDF denied claims by Hamas that troops opened fire on crowds of civilians waiting for aid at a square in Gaza City, saying that Israeli soldiers did not shoot at any stage during the incident and that Palestinian gunmen caused the casualties. Some 21 people were killed and more than 150 wounded in the incident. The World Central Kitchen says that its first maritime aid shipment from Cyprus to Gaza has been fully unloaded on the new pier erected in northern Gaza with Israeli cooperation. The humanitarian aid is being readied for distribution. Meanwhile, alongside fighting the war in Gaza, the IDF is assuring that ample humanitarian aid is arriving to civilians in the enclave. Israel understands that it is an issue, and that is why we've put several mechanisms in place in order to assist the international organizations with their distribution. We've opened humanitarian corridors to allow them to move within those securely. We also announced daily tactical pauses where the international organizations know that they can move around, but also people can go around and pick up the humanitarian aid. And standing by outside Israel's military headquarters now in Tel Aviv is ILTV's Rachel Safti. Rachel, so it's now confirmed that the IDF plan for a military operation in Rafah has been approved by the government, but Rafah is still filled with over a million displaced civilians. The U.S. is raising objections. Do we know, is an IDF operation in Rafah imminent? Hi, Steve. Yes, so a Rafah ground offensive is imminent. We know by now that it's a matter of when and not a matter of if. Since the beginning of this war, Israel has made it clear that one of their main objectives is the dismantling of the Hamas terror organization. And that honestly would not be possible without entering Rafah, which is Hamas's last stronghold, where around four battalions still operate from. Now, we know that the U.S. and Israel's allies oppose to this ground offensive if the, as you said, over one million people uh, who are displaced and currently residing in Rafah aren't protected in any way. Uh, but apparently, as part of the plans that uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has approved, the evacuation of these people and the safety of these people uh, is included in the plans. Now, we don't know exactly where they would be evacuated to, but we understand that if hostage talks don't improve anytime soon and don't advance, we could be seeing their evacuation starting and the initiation of the Rafah ground offensive even during the next few weeks during Ramadan. Rachel, I wanted to ask you about that. The mediators are back in Doha for a potential hostage deal and extended pause in fighting. Hamas reportedly softened its position, but Netanyahu says it's not enough. What seems more likely, a hostage deal or an operation in Rafah? And might that be during Ramadan? 
Yeah, so Hamas does appear to be more lenient regarding their position in hostage ceasefire talks. Yet Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that their requests continue to be absurd. Israel's war cabinet met on Friday to assess Israel's position regarding hostage talks. However, there was no conclusion to that meeting as Shabbat begun. They were supposed to meet once again Saturday night or today, Sunday morning. Yet the meeting was delayed to today at 6 p.m. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant also also met with officials of the IDF, Shin Bet, and the Mossad to discuss the matter. And so we will only know Israel's position and we will only see advancements in the negotiations for hostage for a hostage deal after Israel's war cabinet reassesses today. In any way, uh, we know that we will either be seeing a hostage deal in the next few weeks, and if not, we might very well start to see uh, the Rafah ground operation. Well, Rachel, thank you for that, and welcome to ILTV. Well, joining us now to discuss the latest on the war in Gaza is former Knesset member Dr. Daron Avital. Welcome, Dr. Avital. The IDF submitted a RAFA plan long ago. The War Canab Cabinet has given its approval. But before the civilian population needs to be moved, are there any signs that the population is moving? Uh, no, I mean, the decision, the plans were set. Uh, I should remind you also that I was a commander of our special forces here at Matkal, so the context of the military I'm very familiar with. So the, the point like the point right now is that uh, the plans were approved by uh, Netanyahu, the army made his plans. And I think there are two kinds of plans. There's one plan of this, uh, uh, an extended campaign the way we saw in Khan Yunis, but this would mean, of course, to shelter, remove, evacuate the citizen, the 1.3 citizen in Gaza, in uh, Rafah, Rafiach. So this will take some time, and I think this wouldn't, it depends also on the hostage deal. If there is a hostage deal, it wouldn't start, but I think, before the end of Ramadan. So we have a few weeks ahead. That's my feeling. But if there would be a sort of a limited campaign, and it was discussed with the Americans, the Americans even gave some signal that this is something that they can consider the, to be in sync with the way they see the landscape. So this would be more like targeted killings of leadership of Hamas. And of course, also, if, if some Hamas leaders were succeeded, it seems, to uh, kill uh, number three of Hamas, deputy of the, of, the, of the military arm or the head of the military arm, it depends how you count the thing, then uh, the whole Rafah campaign can be can be considered along those lines. If you succeed, uh, I don't know, to target Sinwar, this will change the plans, of course, because this would mean whether we need to go to Rafah, what does it mean? What would mean, what, how would it look the end of the war? Because you don't win wars just by killing all your enemies. You win war by breaking your enemy. And the question when is the breaking point of the enemy is and when uh, the Rafir campaign, a big Rafir campaign is uh, essential, but the plans are, are there and the army is ready to implement them. Rafa is the only land border not controlled by Israel into Gaza. It was the main smuggling route of weapons to Hamas for many years. Why was that not a goal in the war on day one? Why did the IDF push civilians toward Rafa? No, first of all, we have to, I mean, the, the bastion or the strongholds were, of course, the northern Gaza and uh, Khan Yunis. And then, of course, what we didn't succeed to do is to block, to block the leadership of Hamas and many of their operatives going south through this infrastructure of tunnels. This, we should have maybe, in retrospect, maybe we could have planned it differently. But it's a very sensitive border, the, the border with Egypt. Nobody, and I say nobody, even this government, wants to risk the relationship with Egypt, the peace treaty that is lasting for uh, uh, 40 years and more. Uh, so it has to be in some sync and some cooperation with the Egyptian. In terms of the security agencies of Egypt to Israel, I think the cooperation is good. In the level of the politics, it's sometimes the rhetoric is, uh, is different. Uh, we have to keep those relationships uh, intact, and then we have to see if we operate on the Philadelphia route where the smuggling took place. But it's, it's, it wasn't the only route of smuggling into Gaza, otherwise they wouldn't have this uh, major infrastructure built and this weaponry uh, cache. Uh, so, I mean, it has to be worked out, it has to be worked out in cooperation with the Egyptian, and I think that's, that's the way the army thinks about it, and also the the World Cabinet. 
Well, Dr. Avital, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. Well, mediators are back in Qatar in the latest round of talks, seeking an extended ceasefire in Gaza in exchange for a release of Israeli hostages and Palestinian security prisoners. Mossad chief David Barnea is due in Doha tomorrow to join the discussions. More from ILTV's Devo Klein. Qatari and Egyptian-mediated talks are reportedly making progress after Hamas dropped its demand for a permanent ceasefire before a hostage-for-prisoner exchange. Hamas's new counterproposal would allow the release of some Israeli hostages in exchange for a phased pullback of Israeli troops from parts of the Gaza Strip as well as prisoner releases. Qatar reportedly applied heavy pressure on Hamas to ease its demands, including vague threats to close down Hamas's political office in Doha. The war cabinet met to deliberate the Hamas offer before and after Shabbat, with the prime minister's office saying Hamas is continuing to dig its heels in with ridiculous demands. Publicly, Prime Minister Netanyahu was dismissive of the new proposal, but other Israeli officials have reacted more positively. Netanyahu did agree to send negotiators to Doha to hear details of the plan. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken said the Hamas proposal was within the framework that Israel, Qatar, Egypt, and the United States agreed to in talks in Paris last month. There are still key gaps to close, including the number of Palestinian prisoners to be released. Under the Hamas proposal, Israeli troops would pull back towards central Gaza, allowing some civilians to return to their homes. Hamas is reportedly offering to release women, children, the elderly, and ill hostages in exchange for the release of 700 to 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. The earlier American-backed proposal had said 15 prisoners convicted of serious acts of terrorism would be released for the female prisoners. Rallies organized by the families of the hostages and their supporters urged the government to reach a deal to free their loved ones. We know that there's a deal on the table. We know that this might be the last chance to bring back more than 70 hostages alive and to bring all the hostages that are already dead and bring them to bury them here in Israel. We know that there's a deal on the table, that Hamas gave an answer. We expect the Israeli government to do what it needs to do and close this deal and bring all the hostages back. That's money time. Criticism from Washington continues to be aimed at Prime Minister Netanyahu. U.S. Senator and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, an American Jew and a lifelong supporter of Israel, wants Netanyahu gone and new elections in Israel. Netanyahu today fired back, saying that they forgot October 7th, and instead of pressuring Israel, they should be pressuring Iran. ILTV's William Sharon has more. During a 20-minute speech on the Senate floor, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer defended Israel's right to self-defense, opposed a unilateral ceasefire, and blamed the conflict and deaths on Hamas. But Schumer also had this to say. The fourth major obstacle to peace is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who has all too frequently bowed to the demands of extremists like ministers Smotrich and Ben Gavir and the settlers in the West Bank. Likud issued a statement condemning the U.S. interference in Israeli democracy. Prime Minister Netanyahu insisted that he rejects international pressure, even from friends. Yes, lechatzim, ben lumim, be'etzem limnoa mitam, milikanes lechafiach velashlim tamlacha. Kerosh Moshet Israel ani yodeft al chatzim ma'ele. Nachu osim ze ba'atzlachak v'chamisha chodashim ze zman si betodot melchamot Israel. אני אמשיך להדוף את הלחצים, אנחנו ניכנס לרפיח, אנחנו נשלים את חיסול יתר גדודי החמאס, אנחנו נחזיר את הביטחון ואנחנו נביא את הניצחון המוחלט לעם ישראל ולמדינת ישראל. 
And joining us now is former ambassador to the United States, Donny Ayalon. Donny, Senator Schumer made a 20-minute address on the Senate floor. You were ambassador to the U.S. Uh, he wants BB gone and new elections. Did you ever think you would hear such words from the top elected American Jewish official in the United States during wartime? No, never. And it's, it's highly unusual, Steve. I, mean, I uh, would have expected this coming out of uh, Bernie Sanders, but certainly not uh, Chuck Schumer, which uh, actually points to the fact that um, Prime Minister Netanyahu now is a, a fair game. I would say, in the political uh, arena in the United <clears throat> States. And the fact that uh, Mr. Schumer said what he did, um, and it was, I believe, coordinated with the White House, is very, very worrying. Well, you know that uh, Biden actually applauded the speech. He didn't back away from it. Um, Schumer's not backing away from it. But Netanyahu did respond today, and he responded very forcefully, saying that apparently they've forgotten what happened on October 7th in Israel. Instead of attacking Israel, they should be attacking Iran. Well, absolutely. Not only we have seen a very, very feeble, uh, I would say, response to the uh, Iranians' uh, proxies around the, the region, especially the Houthis. Um, they were meeting with the Iranians, I believe, in, uh, in Oman. And, um, I didn't see anything coming out of that. Uh, no, Iran is really the culprit here. This is the head of the snake. But I believe that um, what uh, we see here is coordinated with uh, Biden. And Biden is trying to uh, actually um, signal here to uh, Netanyahu and to the Israelis that it's not just a personal issue between Biden and, um, and Netanyahu. And um, he doesn't want Netanyahu actually to leverage this um, confrontation to his favor politically. So by uh, sending uh, Schumer, as you mentioned, uh, um, Steve, that, uh, you know, a, a Jewish, a warm Jew who has always been a staunch supporter of Israel, uh, for him to say that, I guess Biden is trying to signal to us, it's not just me. It's not just a progressive um, um, arm of the Democratic Party. It's everyone. And this is why it's uh, uh, of such a uh, concern. D Danny, I got to uh, get to the, I want to ask you one other thing specifically about the North, because many in Israel think that the deadline is already upon us for when Israel could launch a war against Hezbollah inside Lebanon. And that would be even a larger confrontation than the one in Gaza. Are we certain in Israel today that we will have enough weapons from the Americans? That's a very good uh, question. This is something that certainly is on the mind of the strategic planners of uh, uh, the, the, the IDF, of the top commanders. And uh, this is something that um, I think is pretty much out of the pale. That means uh, we saw that when the Americans are trying to distinguish between the government and the prime minister of Israel and the state of Israel, which is also very uh, uh, unusual and at first, uh, that means that they will continue to support uh, the state of Israel. Why? Because Israel is very important for the United States from um, all the, the ethical values, but also for interest. Uh, a strong Israel is a very, very um, high or a top priority uh, for the United States because a strong Israel prevents wars here, deters, uh, keeps stability in the region, and this is what the, the Americans would uh, want most. And another thing, which uh, uh, from the American point of view, is that only a strong Israel will be able or acquiesce to some concessions politically uh, in any future political dialogue. So they will continue to do that, and this is why we see the separation between the state of Israel and, uh, and the prime minister of da Israel. So I have no doubt that they will continue to support Danny? and send arms as much as we need 
All right, or Donnie, we're, sorry we're out of time now, but I'm sure that this U.S.-Israel uh, confrontation is going to only get worse in the coming days, and we'll have you back to follow up on it. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Well, despite Hamas' attempts at incitement, the first Friday of Ramadan passed with police reporting no unusual security incidents. There were incidents in southern Israel and in Judea and Samaria, and IDF Chief of Staff Halevi warned that Hamas was trying to incite Ramadan violence on many fronts. An estimated 80,000 worshippers went up to the Al-Aqsa Mosque on Temple Mount in Jerusalem's Old City. Some 3,000 police maintained order amid fears of disturbances. Hamas had called on Palestinians to come to the Al-Aqsa Mosque to confront Israel over the war in Gaza and barricade themselves inside the building. It did not materialize. Prime Minister Netanyahu pledged that the number of worshippers allowed to pray on the Temple Mount in the first week of Ramadan would be the same as in previous years and that no restrictions would be imposed on Israeli Arabs. For security reasons, Muslim worshippers from Judea and Samaria were limited to men over 55, women over 50, and children under 10. The Temple Mount is the holiest place in Judaism where two biblical temples once stood, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third holiest shrine in Islam, making the site a central flashpoint of the Arab-Israel conflict. IDF Chief of Staff Halevi told troops that Israel is in a multi-front war and that incidents on one front can impact others, with the military fighting in Gaza, Judea and Samaria, and along the northern borders. And there were terrorist attacks over the weekend in Israel and in Hebron in Judea. A 50-year-old Israeli man was stabbed in a coffee shop in the Beit Kama Junction in southern Israel. The victim managed to shoot and kill the terrorist, but later died of his wounds. The attacker grew up in Gaza, but moved to Israel four years ago and gained Israeli papers. And in Hebron, a Palestinian terrorist opened fire toward a Jewish neighborhood from a cemetery in the ancient biblical city. He was shot dead by Israeli soldiers, and there were no injuries reported to Israeli residents. On other fronts, there have been heavy cross-border exchanges on the Lebanese border, alleged IDF strikes in Syria, and another failed Houthi attempt to target a lot. Back to ILTV's Devo Klein. Israeli airstrikes reportedly targeted at least two sites in Damascus province in Syria, including a weapons depot. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says Israeli missiles targeted a weapons depot belonging to the Syrian military and used by Hezbollah in the Kalamun Mountains. A Syrian soldier was reportedly wounded in the attack. The IDF continues pounding Hezbollah positions in Lebanon. Fighter jets struck a Hezbollah military compound in the area of Al Khiam in response to missiles fired toward Akko. IDF fighter jets also struck a Hezbollah observation post in the area of Kafir Kila. The United States military reported on Saturday night that it had intercepted a drone shot by the Houthi rebels over the Red Sea and that another had crashed into the water. There are no reports of casualties or damage. A suspected attack by Yemen's Houthi rebels saw an explosive detonate near a ship early Sunday in the Gulf of Aden, potentially marking their latest assault on shipping through the crucial waterway leading to the Red Sea. No damage to the vessel had been reported, and the crew are reportedly safe. Meanwhile, top figures from Hamas and other terrorist factions reportedly held discussions with Yemen's Iran-backed Houthi rebels to plan the next stage of war on Israel. Hamas and the Houthis belong to the Axis of Resistance, a collection of Iran-backed movements hostile to Israel and the United States that also includes Lebanon's Hezbollah terror group and Iraqi militias. And let's take a look at the weather forecast. Cloudy and windy conditions are expected tonight around the country with temperatures reaching lows of about 13 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow, sporadic rain is expected around most of the country, with temperatures set to reach highs of 19 degrees Celsius or 67 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all the time we have for today's news. For more updates from Israel and all of your devices, check out our ILTV channels, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.TV, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Steve Liebowitz. Be well. Thanks so much for watching. Let's win the war and bring them home.